you all know, today's our last day before we break for the holidays, and uh, we will resume. Our foundry classes will resume on Tuesday, the 9th of January, and right here we'll resume on Thursday, the 11th. So looking forward to that, but I hope you get some rest. Well, last week when we were here, I opened by um, talking about a wedding invitation that Tom and I had received, and I said that there were two ways that you could respond to an invitation. That is to accept the invitation or you could decline the invitation. And then this weekend I found out there's another way to get into a wedding, and that's to crash it. <laughs> and that's exactly what my husband and I did Saturday night. We crashed a wedding. We walked into this wedding, actually the reception, and we did not know a soul. We didn't know the bride, we didn't know the groom, we didn't know their names. We didn't know their background, we didn't know the families, we didn't know anybody. But we walked into this wedding reception because we found out, as many of you know, my son is getting married in April and we have hired a band to play at his reception. And so we found, we've never heard them live, but we've paid for it. So I thought, well, we found out that the same band that we have hired was playing at this wedding that was gonna be taking place near us. So Tom and I decided, well, let's just put on wedding clothes. <laughs> and we walked in like we knew what we were doing, and we just walked in to the reception. Is that wrong? Is that wrong? How many of y'all would judge me for that? Go ahead, judge away. Full disclosure, I did not break any Emily Post rules, though. We did not sit down at the seated dinner. It was a seated dinner. I was like, oh, we did not sit down. We didn't eat anything, didn't even take a bite of cake. We did grab a bottle of water and got about 30 minutes of video of the band that I had to send to my future daughter-in-law for her approval. We took one spin around the dance floor just to <laughs> make sure it was going to work, and it, it is going to work. It's going to be great. And then we left as inconspicuously as we came in. And on the way out, Tom nudges me and he says, hey, why don't you go sign our names in the guest book? He said, oh, freak them out. 20 years from now, they'll go, who in the heck were Tom and Leslie Fry? So I didn't. I, I, I didn't do that. But as we stood at that reception looking around, not knowing any faces, not knowing the story of the bride and groom, we were just kind of impartial witnesses to what was going on in the room. We stood there. We didn't really know if we should like these people or if we should not like these people. So we kind of came away with a very neutral attitude toward the guests and the bride and the groom. It was just very neutral. That's okay. You can have neutral feelings towards lots of things in life. I feel very neutral about broccoli. I don't love it. don't hate it. Neutral. feel that way about the state of North Dakota. <laughs> don't love it. don't hate it. Neutral. But there's one thing in this world that will never elicit a neutral response. And that is how we respond to the person of Jesus Christ. There is no neutrality with Jesus. And he says as much in today's scriptures. Let's look at verse 30. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. As we look forward to this Christmas season, we must look back at that very first Christmas morning when Jesus was born. That first Christmas was the defining moment of history. That first Christmas changed everything. And the events that happened that morning elicit a response from every human being. And there are only two responses. You either say yes and you follow him as your Lord and Savior, or you reject his calling and you are an enemy of the Father. There is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus Christ. That first Christmas, like I said, it was the defining moment of history. And it's as if Jesus drew a line in the sand that morning. You are either on one side of the line standing with Jesus 
are you on are on the other side of the line against Jesus there's no sitting the fence there's no sticking your finger up in the air and saying well I don't know how I feel you have to take a stand that birth that happened that Christmas morning it changed everything has it changed you let's pray father God I just thank you so much that you give us these very bold scriptures this morning. I thank you for the way you have woven them into our lives. And I pray that especially this Christmas season, you will give us a boldness to take the truth of your message to friends and families and that we will be very strong and loving in the way we present who you are and how much you love us. Because that's what Christmas morning was all about, your great love for us. We thank you, Father, for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've got 50 verses to cover this morning. That's a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of different moving parts to the story, right? And so we're just going to kind of take it brick by brick and go through and unpack each one of these stories. Some of it I'm going to have to leave on the cutting room table for time purposes, but last week when we studied, we looked at the last verses and it was an invitation right Jesus gave us an invitation to come to him everyone who's brokenhearted and come to him burdened come to him he invites all of humanity to come to him and what will he do he will give us rest very good well I heard one person rest okay well okay he will give us rest and so as Matthew closed chapter 11 and opens chapter 12. He brilliantly transitions from the idea of that true rest that only comes through Jesus, and he transitions to talking about Sabbath rest, right? Now, Sabbath rest was established by God, and when we talk about God, it's God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the one that instituted Sabbath rest, so he knows better than anybody what it's supposed to look like, right? And so when he and his father put together the idea of Sabbath rest, it was very purposeful. It was for our benefit. It was an act of mercy on his part to give us one day a week a break from the burdens and the toils and the strifes and the pressures of life that come upon us so that we can not only rest and relax, but more importantly, we can rest and relax in the fellowship of believers, in worship experience, worshiping who he is, so that we will not focus on all the other things. We'll focus on him and understand the importance of him in our lives, okay? So that's the purpose of Sabbath rest. It was an act of mercy given to us by God to relieve the burdens in our lives. But over the years, the Pharisees, they had adopted a much different approach. You see, they looked at the scriptures and they didn't see a whole lot of detail as to what Sabbath rest should look like. And they said it was really kind of too vague. So we need to make laws. We need to enact and set up some laws saying what is work and what is not work. And the laws developed over years and now there are hundreds of of laws stating what you can do and what you can't do on the Sabbath, okay? Now, all of these laws, it's the exact opposite of what Jesus intended Sabbath to look like, because all of these laws, remember we talked about last week the yoke? They are now yoked to the law, and it is a burden on them. The Sabbath is not supposed to be a burden, right? It's supposed to be a time of rest and renewing with the Lord, But now the Sabbath, because of all the laws, are an increased burden. And so they're just weighted down under the burden of Sabbath law. So the Pharisees, let me just give you an example. They have such a narrow-minded, dogmatic approach to the Sabbath and that you cannot work on the Sabbath. The enemy, the history documents several occasions where enemy armies of um, Israel would they're wanting to attack Israel, right? When would they attack? On the Sabbath. Why? Because they know that the Jews will not pick up arms because it's considered work to pick up arms, and so they wouldn't fight. History shows that on several occasions, that's exactly what happens. The enemy army comes in and attacks. They don't pick up arms, and they're slaughtered. 
It's crazy, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Some of these laws, they didn't even make sense. And so you see that the showdown is set up for Sabbath rest and what Jesus intended it to be and what the um, Pharisees have co-opted it to be. Okay, so let's look at the first two verses. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now remember, in chapter 10, um, Jesus was teaching and training his disciples, and he's saying, When you go out, don't you need to not pack lots of provisions. You need to carry lightly your load, right? And he says, don't take a lot of food with you. And he says, I'll provide for your needs, this was the whole concept. God will provide for your daily needs. And that's exactly what's happening here. God is providing for their needs as they walk through the grain fields, okay? So they're walking through the field, okay? First thing, Jesus' disciples are not breaking God's law by plucking from the thing. God's law that God and Jesus wrote in the law back in Deuteronomy said, anyone can walk through another man's field and pluck food and eat it. That is perfectly legal to do. It becomes illegal according to God if you take a sickle because that's, you're working then, okay? So, but if you're just walking through, you can pluck all the food you want. That's perfectly fine. But the complaint was that the disciples said they have plucked the grain And what they most likely did, all scholars believe, they plucked the grain and they would put it in their hand and then they'd go like this to separate the um, kernel from the shell, right? And they'd go like this and then they'd blow the shell off. And so then they'd have it to eat. Kind of like reminds me of going to the Astros game, right? You get some peanuts and you crack the shell and you fiddle around in there and you get the nut out and then you blow the, the shells on the ground. That's exactly what they did. And the Pharisees say, oh, when they plucked that, that was reaping. This was threshing. And this, that was winnowing. And all three of those are against the Sabbath law. So, ipso facto, they've broken the law. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? Now, let me just stop right here and make sure we understand. Jesus never broke God's law. Never nor did he ever instruct anyone to break God's law. What is happening here is the Pharisees are doing something. They are going against what the Pharisees have instituted, okay? They're not breaking God's law. They are going against some of the Pharisaical laws. And so Jesus' response to that accusation of having violated the Sabbath law was he says, have you not read the scriptures? (laughs) I mean, y'all, this is, this is a bold move. He's talking to the Pharisees who were the muckety-muck of the religious people of the time. And he says, okay, guys, have you not read the scriptures? Because in the scriptures, he should have said that I wrote, uh, it says, and, and he, so he challenges them. These, these guys are the ones that knew, they knew the scriptures. They knew exactly what the scriptures said. And they were charged with teaching the truth of the scriptures to the people. But they weren't looking at it like that. And so Jesus, then he cites two examples from Old Testament where people did things that were opposite, that kind of broke the Sabbath, but they weren't condemned for it. And he talks about David, and he says, don't you guys remember when David and his men were out running away, crazy King Saul's out about to, to chasing them and killing them, ready to like annihilate them and they're running all over the country and they hiding in caves then they're hiding they take refuge in a temple in a little town called Nob and there's some bread there some holy bread that's set aside for sacrificial purposes okay no one other than the priests are allowed to touch this bread okay but in scripture David and his men they're starving they feed off of that bread and Jesus says hey David wasn't condemned at the time I'm the son of David. Why are you condemning us? And then he goes on use another example. He says, and, you know, it, it doesn't really even make sense because all of your priests are working on the Sabbath and they're doing temple, you know, business for the worshipers. Are, is that not work? You're not, you're not even making sense here, Pharisees. 
And so he challenges them on it. And Jesus reminds the Pharisees of something that he had said on another occasion. We looked at this earlier in the year. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And what he's saying is, it's not about what you do. It's about what is in your heart. And that's what he's looking for. He's mentioned this to them before. They didn't get it before. I think he's saying it again. Repetition, trying to get through their heads. But they're not having any of it. And then Jesus steps up and makes a bold claim. And he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Basically, he's claiming his deity right here in front of the Pharisees. And he's claiming his deity and he's about to back it up. Okay, so he leaves the fields and he winds up in a synagogue. Remember, this is still on the Sabbath. So he's in the synagogue. Who's in charge of the synagogues? The Pharisees. So he is basically on home turf for the Pharisees. And the Pharisees have all their followers there. And I can, in my mind, I'm seeing this as the Pharisees have, are trying to set Jesus up. And they've, I believe, invited this paralyzed man there. This paralyzed man had been in their um, congregation for a while. He's been paralyzed for a while. I wonder how many times he had come to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders, begging for help, begging for prayer, and they did nothing for him. But now when it's convenient for them, they invite him in, I believe, as a prop to try and set up Jesus, knowing that Jesus is full of mercy and compassion and knowing that Jesus will not be able to help himself when it comes to healing this man who is in need. And so they set him up and they say, okay, here's the question, Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, Jesus, you read, he argued back with, not argued, he defended his, um, uh, his approach, and he said, well, look, if a farmer has a sheep that falls into a hole or something, he could pick it up and help that little sheep, right? That's not unlawful. How much more the Father loves you, a human being? So wouldn't he pick you up like a good shepherd would, a wounded sheep, and help that Sheep, And so he turns the question back on them. Did you see? He turns the question, and I think he embarrasses them because he says, are you asking me if it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And I can almost hear him say, seriously? Are you asking me if it's okay to do good on the Sabbath? And Jesus then invites the man with the paralyzed hand to come forward. And y'all, this, this is so cool. Think about this. He says, stretch out your hand. Now, this man, his, his hand is paralyzed. He physically was unable to stretch out his hand. So Jesus is about to really embarrass and play a really mean joke on this guy, or he's about to heal him. So he says, stretch out your hand. Notice Jesus didn't touch him, but he just stretches out his hand, and he is by faith healed, and he reaches out to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus changed everything about that man's life that day. And that man decided that he was no longer going to be neutral. And he was going to step across that line and he was going to stand with Jesus Christ. But Jesus also changed everything about the Pharisees' lives that day too. And they decided to stay on this side of the line in rejecting who Jesus was. It just makes me so sad to think how callous and jaded these Pharisees must have been to see this man who had been part of their congregation, who had been desperate, scholars believe months, maybe years he'd been in this condition, maybe not able to work, support his family. They couldn't help him. Now all of a sudden he's healed, he's perfectly healthy. They can't even say, hey, Joe, that's awesome. What do they do? They decide Let's kill Jesus. Now, up until this point in Matthew, we've seen the Pharisees. They've been accusing Jesus. They've been talking badly about him. They've been spying on him. They've been lecturing him. But this is the first point where we see they actively begin to plot against him. So Jesus' response to that kind of hatred is that he's going to withdraw. He's not going to engage them. He's just going to withdraw. 
And it's such a beautiful picture here. As he withdraws, I hope you noticed, it said that the ordinary folks, big crowds, followed him because they believed and they had faith that he could heal them. So there are a lot of people taking a stand with Jesus. Matthew records how Jesus' reaction to uh, the hatred that was coming at him, his withdrawal. They, uh, Matthew talks about how that is a, fulfill, a fulfillment of prophecy as, um, in verses 19 through 21. It says, He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. First part of that is just a beautiful picture of who he is and his gentleness and his mercy and his compassionate nature. And then I just want to mention a couple of those parts. The bruised reed he will not break. This is just... This is just such a beautiful picture, a bruised reed. Think of a bruised reed, a, a, a stick that's growing up that maybe has been knocked over. And maybe you feel like that this morning. Maybe Christmas isn't all gumdrops and choo-choo trains. Maybe you're going through a difficult time, and you feel like that bruised reed that's been knocked over. This passage is telling us that Jesus, the Messiah, the one that we celebrate his birth this time of year, he will not let you break. He will not come and step on you and keep going. He will be there to comfort you and pick you up and nurture you just like a shepherd with a sheep. And then the second part of that, in a smoldering wick, he will not quench. Maybe because of circumstances in your life, you are here this morning and you used to have faith that was on fire but now because of circumstances maybe it's like a smoldering wick and your faith is just barely hanging on this verse tells us that our savior whom we celebrate his birth this time of year he will not he will not quench that smoldering flame he will if you allow him fan the flames, and build your faith back up, if you let him. It's a beautiful passage of who he is. Jesus changed everything, and we cannot be neutral toward him. We are either with him or we are against him. The next event Matthew records is that of a demon-possessed man. Um, it is an amazing event, and I hate just skipping over, but for time we can't go into the details. But he heals this guy. Uh, miraculously and it said all the people that were watching are amazed and they say could this be the son of David and to me it looks like the ordinary people aside from the Pharisees they're putting the pieces of the puzzle together and they're connecting the dots and they're saying this I think this is the Messiah this is him who we've been waiting for this is our king the Pharisees, however, they hear about the miracles and they see things a lot differently. They didn't doubt that he performed the miracles. What they doubt is the power by which he performs the miracles. And so they say, and they tell their people, this is the important part, they're telling their people, no, 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 he's not from God. He is from Satan. He's getting his power from Satan. And that's what Jesus knows what the Pharisees are saying. And so that's when he starts talking about this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And it's a very serious, serious charge. So the best definition I could find for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is that it is deliberately and knowingly attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to Satan. And so when we see instances of non-believers that have taken this step of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is not an accidental thing. We don't accidentally blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It is intentional, and it, I think, happens over time as our hearts continue to harden toward God's calling on our hearts, and we continue to walk away from Him and ignore His attempts to draw us in. 
And then we get to such a place, well, we don't, but non-believers get to such a place where their hearts are so hardened, I believe God just takes his hands off and allows their decision to be their final say. And I don't think it happens overnight. I think it's a long process to get to that point. But this is the point where the Pharisees have gotten to. Whether it was pride or jealousy or whatever, I don't know what caused them to get this to this point. Their hearts are hardened, and they are attributing the power of Jesus to satanic forces. And some may ask, I hope, I hope this isn't something that you thought, maybe I accidentally blasphemed the Holy Spirit and I'm never going to be forgiven, I'm going to hell. No, um, you can't accidentally blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's intentional, it's purposeful, um, it is done with evil heart, okay? And if you are even thinking that, then um, that, that means you've the Holy Spirit is speaking to your conscience and you could not have committed it, so, so you're good, okay? So then we move a little bit further in the scripture. Verse 30, Jesus draws that line in the sand. Our uh, verse that I've keyed in on this morning, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus in that verse, I believe, has eliminated the possibility of anyone remaining neutral toward him. There is no compromise when it comes to Jesus Christ. Indifference to him and his message is the same as active opposition to him. So you may know someone who says, well, I don't really believe in that whole Christmas thing, and I don't not believe in that Christmas thing. What Jesus is saying here is this morning is if they're taking a neutral stance, they are taking an active opposition because he has said, you are either with me or you are against me. There is no neutrality. And Jesus says, if you're with me, you better have fruit to show that you're with me. And the fruit comes from your mouth. And I would add, it comes from our thumbs too, right? An offshoot of our mouth as we text and Facebook and post and all that kind of stuff. So make sure that you are glorifying him. If you are standing on this side of the line as a believer, your actions, your words, your deeds better be lining up with what you say and better be lining up with who he is. And he's already told us in that Isaiah passage who he is. He is compassionate. He is gentle. He is love. He is mercy. He is humility. Okay? And then just as uh, no sooner had Jesus finished saying that, then um, the Pharisees come up and they say, hey, we want you to perform a sign for us. And I think it's kind of like, perform for us, Jesus. Number one, Jesus never performs miracles just for the sake of doing miracles. There's always a purpose behind them and an intent. And number two, he's already performed lots of miracles that they have witnessed. And so he's not going to play into their game. There's nothing that could um, really please them at this point. And so Jesus replied with a brief history lesson. Y'all read about the history lesson where he talks about Jonah and the Ninevites. The Ninevites, some... Um, Gentiles came to know the Lord. And then he talks about the Queen of Sheba. She went up and visited with King David. She came to know the Lord, both Gentiles. And he contrasts that to the Pharisees. And he says, look, these Gentiles came to know the Lord. They repented. But you, Israel, you have the Messiah standing in your presence. And yet you aren't coming to know the Lord. And he says to the Pharisees, those Gentiles, Queen of Sheba and the Ninevites, they're going to be in the kingdom with me forever, and you aren't. Whoever is not with me is against me. While Jesus is talking about who will and will not be in his kingdom, the doorbell rings. And it's his mother and his brothers. And they've come to talk to him for whatever reason, um, not sure what that reason was. Um, scholars don't know, but he's there. And um, this allows Jesus a perfect segue to go into talking about a kingdom family and who will be in his forever family. And he says it's not about bloodline. He's not dissing his, uh, his earthly family. He's not showing them disrespect here, but he's saying there's a family that's much more important and that's my forever kingdom family. And the only way you get into the kingdom, it's not how you were born. It's not how good you are. It is whoever does the will of my Father. 
amazing passage, lots of scripture here today. Sorry we had to kind of fly through it, but it all comes back to me for the purpose of this lesson is that verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. And I just want to let you know there's no neutrality when it comes to Jesus Christ. The ultimate test of a person's life is what you do with the person of Jesus. Ladies, Christmas is about one thing. It's about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That first Christmas was the defining moment in history. It drew the line. That first Christmas changed everything. Did it change you? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that you give us these life-changing verses because you love us so much and you want us to spend eternity with you in heaven. Father, let us be women and men who make the choice to stand with you forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies, the kids are going to be coming in in just a second. We're going to move this and that out of the way. Welcome, moms and dads and families of CBS. We are so excited you're going to be here. Our kids are singing a cappella this year, which we love because we want you all to be able to hear their beautiful voices. So, um, again, Merry Christmas, and we're so glad you're here.
family, this is a repeat after me song that we do. So I sing the first part and then the kids echo it back. We invite you to sing with us. This is a very special time of year, and we're celebrating a very special child's birthday. So we would like to sing happy birthday to Jesus.
And for our grand finale, we will sing Jingle Bells. Thank y'all so much for coming to our Christmas program. Your children are such a precious gift. We absolutely love getting to be with them every week. And they just, they fill my cup to overflowing. So thank y'all so much for sharing your children with us. We will meet y'all back at our classrooms. So we'll see y'all a little bit. And Merry Christmas.